We also have a larger support system for faculty who are just learning OER. And like all of you, we're still struggling a bit to take advantage of the excellent open resources available and to become confident with our own development process. Even after several years of commitment, we wish that we were making more progress. Um, like all of you, we, we realize the importance of providing a supportive environment early on and have undertaken several policy changes with OER creation, adoption, and use. Our administration and faculty have to work together to identify and overcome all of these obstacles as they are recognized. Um, policies and procedures were identified as crucial to providing our support system for many reasons, and these are just a few of them. Our Board of Trustees recognized the primary goal of saving money on textbooks. Um, and they sort of issued an edict. Our faculty did not warm up to that edict very quickly. Rightfully, they see themselves as the pedagogical experts. And so HVC then recognized the need for a faculty-driven process, and we created an OER task force to engage faculty. We created faculty development courses around the creation and use of OER, and we identified the policy issues is crucial to faculty concerns. Um, our new policies addressed faculty, institutional, and student concerns, um, and they're really quite simple. We made changes to the textbook policy first. Um, our textbooks now do not have to be commercially produced, but open textbooks have to be approved using the same departmental standards as commercial ones if they will be one of two main texts allowed for a course. Faculty are given a great deal of freedom to use OER as supplementary material, whether their own or CC licensed by someone else. This may be the single best encouragement for getting our faculty interested and involved, since it's a less demanding approach and it doesn't shake up our cultural paradigm too much. Um, we're also working with the bookstore vendor to expand options and reduce costs of textbooks through rentals um, and other options. In addition, we embedded Creative Commons statements in the copyright procedures as juxtaposed against the more limiting fair use guidelines of US copyright law. We're allowing employees to maintain control of Creative Commons licensed materials that they produce um, as a cornerstone of our IP policies and procedures. And we encourage the use of open materials as education-friendly alternatives to more strictly licensed materials. The libraries include public domain, OER, and other free materials in the library catalog, research guides, and database lists also. Um, one thing we did was we created a comprehensive handbook for faculty that encourages use of CC licensed materials and outlines ownership considerations. Um, I was really lucky I got to draft this handbook. Um, so I got to throw in OER wherever I wanted. Um, the IP policy contains all the elements required by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board to protect the interests of the state and the institution while still encouraging creation. And, uh, these are the issues that kind of make, in my opinion, a good IP policy. As you can see, one of the cornerstones is that um, employees retain ownership of items created under a CC license. Ownership is a really big issue for our faculty, for all of us, I guess. Um, this is this is the, um, the this is the task list for our copyright and intellectual property committee. To be honest, we really aren't doing all of these things yet. We've only really met once, um, and and when we met that time, we actually discussed copyright as related to the student handbook. So it really had nothing to do with OER. Um, is it working? Well, most of you said none, and frankly, we're kind of we're kind of saying that 
it's really tough getting started. We don't really have buy-in. Commercial publishers make things so easy for faculty. I think we've all done a poor job of explaining all the benefits of OER to our faculties. Um, our biology department, for example, has already rejected the OpenStax college biology textbook saying that it doesn't meet their needs and it doesn't even exist yet. Um, so that's, that's, that's a classic um, resistance issue, I think. Um, on the other hand, Jeff Shelstead mentioned at the Connections Conference that one of our faculty members keeps flat world knowledge on their toes. She's one of our early adopters and will probably have the perfect textbook for her students one of these days if she doesn't already. So that's it for me. Thank you. And I'll take questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Angela. Any questions for Angela about the intellectual property, property policy? We have some time for questions towards the end if you want to save them, or you can jump in now. I think you made a, made a great point, Angela, of course, about the, the uh, uh, importance of buy-in buy from the faculty. <laughs> it's not going to work if it's, if it's uh, from the top down. Okay, then let's move on to Tom. We've got Tom Caswell from Washington State, uh, who's going to inform us about a lot of exciting development in Washington. Hi there. Um, can anyone hear me okay? Can I get a uh, green check if you can hear me? Or maybe James, you can let me know. I'm going to. I'm going to assume that you can hear me because we did a check earlier. So uh, let's see. I'm doing a quick time check. So uh, at 12:30, we'll wrap things up. So hi, I'm Tom Caswell. I'm the Open Education Policy Associate for the State Board, Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And I'm excited to have a few minutes to talk with all of you about some of the things that Washington has done and, uh, and is doing to um, promote open education through policy work uh, in our state. So, Kurt? Excuse me, Tom. This is James. Just, just sorry, Tom. Just wondering if, uh, if you could uh, uh, try, try the audio again. Uh, come oh, okay. kind of fuzzy here. Yeah. Is, um, is that any better? Uh, uh, okay. Marginally better. Uh, let me you were crystal clear during the, during, the, during the sound check before the session. You were really how it works. Well, I'll try and speak up a little bit, but um, go ahead and if it's not sounding good, cut in and, and let me know, and I can jump on the phone if that's better. Thank you. And again, a reminder to those of you who are on the phone, if you can turn off your computer speakers, that would cut down on the mechanism. Okay. Thank so, um, James, OK to proceed to the um, to illuminate, or do you want me to switch over right now? Um, Tom, well, I'd say, um, Tom, well, I'd say if, you, if you can uh, dial in on the phone, that would probably yeah. be yeah, I'll dial in. real good. Yeah, I'll, I'll dial in uh, right away. Um, and uh, uh, so just give me two minutes, and uh, hopefully uh, people can uh, give me 30 seconds and, and I'll be right in there. Very good. Very good. We'll do it. I'll do a song and dance here and I'll uh, go back to, to something that I forgot before uh, to, to mention and that is that we have uh, a couple of new uh, community college members of the uh, Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources and that is uh, those are Pasadena City College and Roan State uh, Community College in, in Tennessee and Pasadena City College in, in Southern California. So welcome to them. I think uh, um, I don't think we have anybody from Pasadena with us, but uh, I think Catherine is here from Rhone State. So thank you very much uh, to the to both of those colleges for stepping up and becoming members. And uh, we look forward to uh, many more of you out there becoming members. And I'll call your attention, everybody's attention, to the chat window. It's uh, pretty, pretty uh, 
heavy heavy traffic in the chat window. A lot of great links flying back and forth in the chat window. Hope you can can uh, grab some of those. Uh, whole the host of uh, a variety of policies uh, being put up and and uh, with links in the chat window. And there we have Tom. Hi there. Um, how's this sounding? This much better. better. Much better, Tom. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna cruise here. Cruise through a few things just to just to make sure we leave time for everyone else and hit the high points at the same time. So, um, and uh, also want to leave some time for questions. So, uh, okay. So first off, I just want to say I um, I realize that uh, in a lot of ways I'm preaching to the choir here. So that's my there's my choir slide. Um, I realize that there are a lot of folks here who support. OER and who are trying to find good ways to uh, engage in promoting OER through um, through policy. And so, um, part of what I want to do is tell the story of Washington and how we got to where we are, um, highlighting some of the policy moves along the way, so that uh, hopefully others can can learn from those and and uh, and um, make use of some of our um, some of our ideas. Um, so first off, I, I think it's important to to start out looking at what your current challenges are. And in Washington, we had some some pretty big challenges. Um, we had textbook costs that were through the roof. We had really really expensive textbooks, um, like like all of you. Um, but certainly in the community colleges and in our technical colleges, the cost of textbooks was um, a, a really big chunk of the total outlay for an education. Um, we had uh, challenges with time to degree and student completion, and we also have uh, a fair amount of adjunct faculty turnover, and so we had challenges there as well. So converting those to opportunities is uh, is, is is where I want to go with that. And so we asked ourselves some questions. Uh, first off, we asked, "What if all state-funded educational content was open access? Uh, what what kind of efficiencies would that would that yield?" And um, started with a simple idea, and it was that we wanted to uh, allow public access to publicly funded educational materials. So we started with building on common or building on existing goals. And I think I think this is important in any scenario. But for Washington, we had a goal of increasing access and completion. So if we just add to that, we get increased access and completion by providing high quality, affordable openly licensed educational resources. So we built on that goal. Um, another thing that is important to, to mention here is that we, in Washington, we have a, a, strong, governance, a strong governance structure in place. And, um, and so we, we, are, we were able to leverage that. We have um, presidents uh, we organizing. We have, we have organized commissions and councils. Uh, we have uh, trustees. State board has a, uh, a an organization as well, and uh, from the state board to the staff that support it, and faculty association organizations that um, that we could also work through. So the question then became how how can our system work together to successfully pursue the appropriate changes? So we looked at policy opportunities, and uh, the first opportunity that came along, and this is while Cable Green was. Uh, was at the state board, and he had the opportunity to work on the strategic technology plan. And as part of that plan, of course, looking at efficiencies and uh, ways to um, ways to make our system more effective at uh, at what we were doing, um, we were able to bake right into the uh, to, into that document um, a the idea of open education resources and the efficiencies that, that come with OER. So um, we also, in that document we put, and I'll just quote here from part of it, that uh, OER and contributing to it requires significant change in the culture of higher education. And it requires, rethink, uh, it requires thinking about content as a common resource that raises all boats when shared. And so right, right there from that, um, guiding document, we were able to um, integrate the idea of using open resources in a 
in, in a in a commonly uh, shared and a, in an in an efficient way that uh, that could be transformative for our for our system. Um, with that, we also recognize that for us, and I think this would apply across across uh, any system. But for us, rule number one when working with faculty was always to invite and never mandate. Uh, that was important as we as we went forward um, because we uh, we wanted to respect uh, faculty um, in their in their role as uh, as the, the subject matter experts in their role as uh, the curators of, of the, the learning content to their and, and um, um, their their ability to have that uh, that that freedom. So that so we, we made sure we invited rather than mandated. Um, we also partnered with legislators, and this was important. We partnered with legislators based on uh, efficient use of state tax dollars and also saving students money. So a couple of examples: uh, substitute second substitute House Bill 1025. Uh, we inserted text that. Uh, for faculty to consider the least costly practices in assigning uh, course materials. We inserted the, the word um, open textbooks um, into, that, uh, into that legislation. And, um, and again, small, a small uh, modification, but paving the way for, um, for open textbooks and OER to, um, to, be, to be considered as, as part of uh, the, the materials that faculty should look at um, when, when trying to find the, the best value for dollar. Another example, a second substitute house bill 1946 um, talked about sharing technology and sharing content. And uh, the wording said uh, in sharing digital content including but not limited to open courseware, open textbooks, open journals, and open learning objects. So again, just paving the way uh, in in the legislation for uh, for OER to be accepted and embraced in our system. Another strategy that was important was including students. Um, the idea here that obviously cutting textbook costs for students is uh, is helpful. Um, also, because students are many of them using uh, state need grants and federal uh, federal grants such as Pell grants. Uh, cutting textbook costs is, is helpful not only for students but taxpayers as well. It made, made all kinds of sense to find efficiencies in, in the exploding costs of, of textbooks. That was an area where, where we really could um, get a lot of different uh, stakeholders on board, and that included students. So we, it's an important part to, to, uh, to, to mention. And we worked through the Student Voice Academy. Um, uh, in our community and technical colleges, they had for three years running. They had uh, student textbook costs as the top issue, and uh, and it continues to be an important issue in their in their um, advocacy. Finally, we got to the um, to the open license. The state board, um, excuse me, the open policy that was implemented at the state board about a, a year and a half ago, which said that uh, all digital software education resources. Knowledge produced through the, through competitive grants and offered through the state board or managed by a state board will carry a, a Creative Commons attribution license, and this this was really a major a major step forward in um, in in communicating the importance of the open license uh, and and in making clear that um, if you're going to take optional money, if you're going to take optional grant money through the state board, that you need to be willing to share that. And again, this was an invitation. If you don't want to take the money, uh, if you don't want to share it this way, then you don't have to take this. This is optional, um, optional dollars. So the open license, the the state board's open policy was uh, was a big a big step. Um, and then and then that paved the way for thinking about uh, additional work that we could do around um, around creating and curating curating resources in our system across our 34 community and technical colleges for, um, for making, organizing the, the existing resources and uh, making them work for us in Washington State. 
So the Open Course Library was uh, and has been over the last uh, year and a half has been a um, a, a major focus of the state board. And we're designing 81 high enrolling courses. We've got 42 uh, 42 courses completed, and uh, actually another 40 left. So we may end, may end up with 82 by the time we're done. But uh, but those those high enrollment courses um, are again they're meant to um, help the help the students to keep the textbook costs down. Um, they're aimed at they're aimed at faculty, so these resources are brought, are organized and created by our college faculty and um, shared with the world, um, so that other faculty in our system, including adjuncts who have sometimes very limited time to prepare their their lessons, can rather than starting from scratch, they can pick up good, uh, high quality OER and start um, start from there and modify it to suit their needs and the needs of their students. So we've. We've so far engaged over 100 college faculty in creating these materials. Um, we've shared them out. Uh, we've had uh, over 125 different countries come and, and visit uh, visit our our, uh, our website, and uh, we've had uh, over 27,000 visits to the OpenCourseLibrary.org page. So I'll, I'll share that link in the chat. But OpenCourseLibrary.org is where you can. Um, browse those resources and see w which courses we've we've worked on. Um, really, the focus here was to fill in the gaps, use existing materials, don't reinvent the wheel where you don't have to, um, and uh, and then where where we needed to, we filled in the gaps uh, with our own original content. All of it was Creative Commons attribution licensed, so CC BY. And and Tom, for those this is James. For those who are now yeah. uh, fami familiar with with your project, those courses are available to all of us for all of us to use. Correct. Correct. Yeah. That's and and that's important. Um, thanks for thanks for underlining that point. Um, the Open Course Library right now is housed in a learning management system called Angel. Uh, we've posted the information on OpenCourseLibrary.org. Uh, for the guest account to get in there, and we've also used uh, we've we've partnered with Connections to to uh, they are hosting the the uh, common cartridge files that can be used in any learning management system. So you can you can browse through the uh, the materials on on our Angel site. If you like what you see, you can grab the entire package and you can put it into your uh, learning management system and uh, make changes from there. Uh, the other step that we've taken is we are shifting. We're actually moving all of our content into a Google Docs. Um, after the first phase, after the first 42 courses, we realized that we we could make it even easier for everyone to access and to modify the materials. And so we shifted over to Google Docs, which is essentially just an online word processor. And so all the materials will, will be organized and available through through Google Docs. And we're moving the first 42 courses into Google Docs as well. So, so by the by uh, by spring of next year, spring of 2013, all 80 all 82 courses will be available in Google Docs, and uh, all of that will be linked from the OpenCourseLibrary.org site. Great. And uh, Tom uh, Kel Kelvin Bentley had a, had a question uh, yeah. in the chat. Have you seen a gradual increase in the adoption of OER over time? In other words, are an increasing number of faculty adopting OER as they observe the early adopters' uh, use of OER? Yes, um, I think, and I think that really is that that's um, a good a good question, um, and it's a good thing to point out that there is a tipping point, and I think that um, I think that we're we're at that tipping point where uh, where we have now over a hundred faculty within the system who have, in one way or another, been working on OER. Um, we had we also had a, um, a policy for those for those who created um, the courses, those who were the teams or individual faculty who were involved in creating the the first 42 courses. They were asked to uh, create the course in such a way that they would that they would adopt it themselves. So um, so our first uh, 42 courses were at, at a minimum were adopted by those those same faculty who created them. So we've we've um, We've gotten uh, across our system. We've we've 
we have faculty now who are in essentially all the co colleges who are who are talking about OER and who have, um, who have begun to use it themselves. And that really is, you know, getting that foot in the door with faculty. Um, there was there were some concerns, and there was a lot of um, uh, misinformation about uh, the state board coming in and, and sort of mandating, you know, this this uh, these materials that would that would have to be used by everyone. And uh, that we had to make sure that the, the message was was understood that this is really just uh, an effort to to give high quality materials, put them in the hands of faculty. Um, what the faculty do at that point, if they use them, if they use them as is, or if they modify them, it's uh, totally up to them. And if they like half of what they see, and they want to, they want to tear out the other half and put in something else, then we we were um, the open license from Creative Commons allows that to happen. And uh, and and so getting that message, um, making sure that the uh, we cleared up any any confusion or misinformation, that was all in, in, important in the early stages. And I think that we, like I say, I think we've hit that tipping point where uh, the acceptance of the Open Course Library and of OER in general is is growing and it's uh, growing rapidly because I think faculty are seeing that um, that they do have control. That they can build OER and they can uh, they can even share their own materials as OER, and it doesn't take anything away from from their role. In fact, it actually adds it adds uh, all kinds of opportunities for, for them. So um, we have faculty working with MIT and and with Carnegie Mellon Open Learning Initiative. All these opportunities that came about because they were willing to share. So so telling those stories and sharing that across our system. Um, not just from the state board, but from faculty talking to other faculty, is is how we we reached that tipping point. And um, and I was basically done. Uh, I know my my 15 minutes is, is done as well. So um, I'll I'll just I'll just say that what's what's next for us is is basically just um, just continuing to ask you know how we how we optimize the the open resources that we have and how we use technology to. Um, to continue to improve the, the content from here, um, so we we are certainly are not done, at, but I think we, we've hit a, a tipping point that uh, is very exciting as as OER becomes um, better understood and accepted across our colleges. So um, so with that, um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll stop for questions or just pass it right on to the next uh, person and uh, and thank you. Great, thank you so much, Tom. I want to I want to call attention to some some great data that Nicole Allen uh, from the Student Pergs has posted in the chat window, and that is that the Pergs estimates that the first 42 Open Course Library courses will save students 1.26 million dollars in the first year. That's more than the 1.818 million dollars that it took to build them. Thank you so much, Nicole. That's great, great, great information. And whenever I need data like that, I always I always look at look at your website and the Student Pergs has great information on, uh, on on OER from the student perspective. And and one last question for you, Tom. Um, Andrea Henney from uh, San Diego asked uh, whether you're going to do be able to collect any data uh, from the student perspective, uh, increase in student completions, uh, anything along those lines uh, in your plans. Uh, that's a great um, that's a great uh, lead-in question. I didn't get to that, but but thank you, Andrea, for for uh, allowing me to mention this. Um, so yes, we are we actually have some ongoing research into student completion rates. Um, but we have preliminary data um, at this point, and we're actually we're looking more closely into um, different different strands in in uh, student completion. But specifically, we we seem to be seeing um, more significant differences where where um, uh, in in areas with uh, with struggling students which is fantastic um, you know in other words we we see there's no significant difference across um, across the, the broader swath of the system um, what that tells me is we're not doing any harm um, the using open resources if it, if it delivers the same quality that we've had so far and, and the same or similar com completion rates um, I'm actually happy because uh, what that tells me is um, we're not doing any harm, by, and we're saving all kinds of money by doing it this way. And we've we've, we've created the potential to do much much better um, because these are open resources, because they carry a Creative Commons open license. 
it allows us to improve. Essentially, this is the starting point, and we can use uh, we can use continuous improvement feedback loops to make it much much better from here. So that data is very preliminary at this point, but um, but we're we are um, we are doing that research, and we will we will make all that public and share it through um, all of the OER channels. So very good. Question. All right, very good. We have uh, one more question, Jock. Uh, yes, Jock is has been asking uh, if you could ask a question. Jock, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Tom, I'm very impressed with the well thought out plan you've got and how you do it. Um, one question for you. Um, in developing um, open courses, um, I think I want to see if you agree with this and, and, and where you would go with the solution. If you were to develop an open course and I teach a similar subject, I might feel, yes, you're doing some stuff I like, but other stuff I would do differently and so forth. In other words, I wouldn't necessarily buy in wholesale into everything you've done and just follow that slavishly the way you've done it. Um, I've got a you know my um, openlanguages.net project and where I do Afrikaans and what I do is I go wider. I create a resource that covers, for example, Afrikaans 101, 102, and 201, and that would al and I and I really go wide with what I offer more than I would teach in the specific 101 course, and so and then I develop a curriculum that you know, with hyperlinks just goes to all the places that I prefer to uh, put together. And I would allow anybody else teaching to develop their own um, specific curriculum that uses my resources to have that flexibility. Do you build that kind of a context into it so if other teachers come that they can all layer over the resources that you've got their own uh, curriculum to pull what they want and in the order that they want it? Jacques, that's a great question. And by the way, it's great to see you um, joining the meeting. Um, Jacques is an old friend, and uh, and so um, thank you for the question. I um, I think that um, I think that what we've done so far, we have actually built in multiple um, multiple uh, uh, perspectives, if you will. Uh, just as an example, our communications, uh, our public speaking course, actually was developed by a, a, a technical college and by a faculty member at a technical college. But it, because it was also um, uh, it was reviewed by several peer, review, peer reviewers, um, enough feedback was given to actually create a separate strand specifically for, um, for with more of a rhetorical emphasis that, that you would find in, in, uh, in, in more of the, the community college system. Um, in the community college approach of teaching that same course. But to, to speak more to, just to, to touch on what you asked in terms of going forward, um, that's really one of the reasons behind our move to Google Docs. We feel like um, it actually gives us, um, it first of all simplifies the, the interface significantly. Um, you don't necessarily have to be using an LMS at all to be engaged in, in to be contributing. Mm -hmm. But it, it, we're also still looking for um, Technical solutions to allow um, to allow the two-way sharing that you're talking about. At this point, uh, really, we have you know we have um, uh, we have courses that will if they are not if they are not maintained, they will just become um, sort of a, a trophy case or or just a one-way sharing. So we really are looking for ways to um, to uh, create uh, communities around each of these courses so that uh, so that we'll have a two-way sharing and a a sustainable solution for um, maintaining the courses going forward. So thanks, thanks for that question. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. And I'm glad to, glad to see the questions coming. We've got, we do have more questions in the chat window, but I want to, in the interest of, of time, I do want to keep on moving and give time to, to Robin Donaldson uh, with the Florida Distance Learning Consortium, who is going to share with us some of the highlights of things, of the many, many on, things going on Florida that touch on, in Florida that touch on, touch on, uh, state, touch on policy. state policy. Okay. Hi. Thanks for the intro there. Um, I, I know we've got about 15 minutes left here. Is that correct? And, um, yeah. and Katie yeah. is going to be coming on after me, so I'm going to keep this pretty quick here. Um, we've just got some legislation that passed, and we are actually legislative, legislatively mandated to uh, promote and provide recommendations regarding OER and open textbooks uh, to all of our higher education institutions. 
And in addition, we've been asked to create a task force of representation from our institutions uh, to create a, a process, standardized process, for the review and approval of our open textbooks. And this would be uh, two level. Um, one would be more at a high level review of the books and then also some sort of a review process and approval for the departments uh, slash institutions. Um, and then we uh, uh, are working with cable now. Originally, I had sent out a Google spreadsheet to collect policy uh, from our different institutions. And, and uh, so what we're going to be doing is working with cable and, and putting it into their, their wiki system. Uh, the hope is to provide our institutions with some sample policies. So uh, this was an excellent, excellent uh, opportunity for me to learn about what our different states are doing in institutions. Um, and then what we're closing up here at the end of this month is a survey that went out to all of our institutions um, for faculty, which was an OER one, to, to examine their use and awareness of OERs, open textbooks, and open courseware. And then a student textbook survey, which dealt with while it wasn't um, focused on OER, it does have OER questions in there. We're trying to understand uh, exactly what kind of formats that they are using right now. Are they using the digital, the print? Uh, what kind of resources they are using that um, impacts their success rate? Because that then drives the kind of ancillaries that uh, we'll recommend for supporting open textbooks. Um, we also will have that report out, I think, uh, within about four weeks of um, closing the, the survey. That's our goal. So you'll be hearing about that soon. Um, back in February, we had a statewide uh, symposium. It was also open up to um, the, you know, the general public. And, uh, very well received and attended. And we have the videos up in YouTube if you'd like to uh, see what some of those discussions were. That has been very helpful to our institutions and has actually led to additional requests for more um, another symposium and, or else um, smaller meetings with both our textbooks uh, publishers as well as discussions on the the open textbooks. So, um, and then uh, one last project that we're doing for our open textbook um, project is uh, we're creating some videos for you know just what is OER and open textbooks um, and you know why they're important as well as an additional um, Creative Commons video. We really want to, we've had requests from our faculty to give them more training and in short videos as far as um, combining resources. They seem to be, have, they understand the concept of the Creative Commons licensing, but they're, they're struggling with uh, the combining resources and different licenses and how that impacts how they have to license their, their new um, resource that they have created. Um, and that's, that's about it. About it. We have been reorganized, so we'll be changing from the Florida Distance Learning Consortium to uh, the Florida Virtual Campus, and that'll happen in July. So it's just a main change. We still have all the, the same um, requirements that we have to meet, and, and um, but just regrouping with some other organizations. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to send them my way, or uh, you can contact me uh, offline. Very good. Thank you so much, Robin. And, and you can see that there's so many different pieces to the puzzle of, of putting together 
uh, an, an effective case uh, in terms of changing or adopting policy. And, and Florida has, Florida's learning consortium has been really a leader in in gathering data uh, that can help you make your case. Whether whether or not you're in Florida, you can still point to their data uh, to identify larger trends out there. So you're really doing a great service for all of us. Uh, and and, and uh, Robin mentioned the uh, policy registry, and we're fortunate to have Cable Green here from Creative Commons, formerly of the uh, Washington State Board of Technical and Community Co Technical and Community Colleges, or Community and Technical Colleges. I can never remember the order. Uh, sorry, Tom and Cable. Uh, and Cable, you, if you, could you share share a few words about the policy registry that uh, Florida and Creative Commons are working on? Uh, yes, uh, thanks very much, uh, and thanks for the intro, Robin. Robin's doing just fabulous work down there in Florida. These folks continue to really be leaders in not just open textbooks, but OER and open policy in general. So congratulations to all their good work. Um, I just dropped a link in, and I'm going to application share here real quick. Uh, let me just bring up my browser on the screen, and you should be able to see that. Um, I am going to let that come up. I won't move it here. The idea is uh, Creative Commons and several others, uh, Florida, UNESCO, uh, the OECD, which are both international governmental organizations. There's a project in New Zealand. Uh, and many, many others have uh, suggested what, um, what David from British Columbia suggested a minute ago, which is, you know, when we work together and when we share uh, information and when we seek to openly license and not duplicate efforts that we're all able to move much faster as a collective than we are ever are able to move alone. And this is also true with open policies. And so there are uh, several uh, aspects of what we might all collaborate on, but one of the most obvious and the most simple is simply to pull together a list of the existing uh, OER policies, um, those that have uh, passed as law, uh, those that have failed uh, and were never enacted are still interesting learning examples, uh, those that are institutional or system policies like some of them that you've heard of today, and to pull all those together in one place um, with all of the links and the, um, the information about what country they're from, what language they're in, what grade level they're for, uh, who the contact is, et cetera. And to make all that openly available um, uh, on a wiki, make it easily updatable by the authors of those policies, wherever they might be in the world, and to share that information so that when Arkansas, who might be on the call today, uh, or maybe somebody in Ghana wants to set up an open policy, that they don't have to start from scratch. Um, so to that end, uh, Creative Commons was re recently given a small grant to put together what we're calling an OER policy registry. And again, partnering with, with Florida and UNESCO and all the other folks around the world who are engaging in similar efforts and um, essentially putting out the call to say, if you um, have participated already in an open policy and uh, built one, uh, please contribute it. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you a couple links here. Uh, one of them, uh, it's just kind of a three-step process here. It's very simple. Uh, one, we ask people to contribute any OER policies uh, that you know about via this simple Google form, uh, which we'll take a look at. Uh, two, uh, take a look at that spreadsheet that that Google form is generating. And if you see an open policy on there um, that you know some of the information needs to be updated or maybe is uh, out of date, to please contact us. Initially, we will manually uh, make those updates for just the next month. But then what we're going to do is take all of this information and move it over to the Creative Commons Wiki, where it will be uh, open. Every, all the text will be CC BY licensed, uh, and anybody will be able to make updates, so we won't be a bottleneck. Uh, and then third, if you would all please uh, push this information out to your colleagues, uh, tweet about it, put it on your blogs, et cetera. Um, and then let me just go briefly into the Google form. Uh, you'll see all the same uh, early text information, but then it's very simple. What's the title of the policy? What's the URL? What's the description? Uh, who are the authors or the sponsors of the bill or the, or the legislation or the institutional policy? Uh, what's the date? So uh, when was it put into play? Uh, what's its status? Is it uh, proposed, current, replaced, revoked? Uh, you don't know, et cetera. 
Uh, what jurisdiction does it apply to? So the Washington State Open Policy, for example, is a system policy. It's not a state policy. It's not a national policy. It's a system policy. So it's important uh, to know. In our early conversations with Florida, Florida said, look, uh, our legislature is really interested in other U.S. states that have launched open policies, and we're not really interested in policies that didn't pass. We're interested in policies that did pass. And so one of the features on the wiki will be that Florida and others will be able to go in and sort by the information that they're looking for so they can get the results. Uh, country, uh, what government, any tags you want to put on it, uh, the license on the document. So uh, does the document have, say, a Creative Commons license on it, or is it all rights reserved, and then any other comments. So you can see it's very simple, and I'll go ahead and uh, close out of this here. Um, very simple to enter that policy. Um, and then last thing I'll say before I uh, hop off, if I can get out of application sharing here. And let's see here. I forgot how to use the old version of. Well, uh, James, maybe you can turn off my app sharing for me. I'd appreciate that. And then the last, uh, the last thing I'll mention is that this open uh, or OER policy registry is really a first step uh, toward what where we're uh, really pushing on open policy, which is to set up an OER, uh, an open policy institute, where OER will be one component, but uh, so will open textbooks and open science. Uh, and open teaching and open licensing, et cetera, uh, because what we're hearing uh, from uh, our, the global community that we all work with is that there are many open advocates and policymakers at all levels all around the world who simply have open policy opportunities, as we've been discussing today, but they need help. And they need help with slide decks and talking points. And they want to talk to people like the presenters today who have gone before them, who know where the pitfalls are and the barriers, and they want to talk to those folks. Um, if they're thinking about open textbooks policy, right, they want to talk to Nicole and get all the great data uh, that she's got. They want to have webinars about this stuff. They'd like to have an annual meeting when they can get together and share open policy successes, challenges, and next steps. And so uh, Creative Commons has uh, put together some funding around this. We'll be having a big meeting with several of the open policy players, uh, many of which are on the, uh, <laughs> on the call today. Uh, and we'll be uh, moving forward uh, looking to set up an open policy institute. Uh, and then uh, maybe a final note, we're also putting together a school of open, uh, also a big tent initiative with peer-to-peer -peer universities. So more to come on both of those. Thanks, James. Wow, Cable, lots of great stuff. Thanks so much. We really appreciate that. And uh, we just want to reiterate Cable's uh, starting point there that we're, we're so much engaged in education, uh, in, in, especially in the open education uh, realm, with sharing uh, content. That, that's our whole, whole thrust, of, thrust of effort is sharing content. Well, why not share policy and share resources in, in, in moving the whole movement forward as well? It's, 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 it's a very obvious thing to do and, and it's uh, but you know it's one of those things that's so obvious that it's it's you don't think of it until somebody actually does it so uh, hats off to all of you uh, at Creative Commons and uh, and Florida and UNESCO and, and the other folks who are involved we really appreciate that cable 